Tēnā koutou i tēnei ahi ahi, nā mi inoi ki a koutou katoa. E nā manu hiri, matara rahi, e nā hoa mahi, e nā toera, e nā kaito toko, me nā hoa. Nō mai hari mai ki te whare wānanga. A very warm welcome to you all, family and friends, colleagues, students, members of the senior leadership team, and our broader public community to the inaugural lecture of Professor Rod Badcock. I'm Jennifer Windsor, Acting Vice-Chancellor of Te Heringa Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. Professor Badcock joined the university in 2014 as Principal Engineer of Paiho, Robinson Research Institute with this being when the Robinson itself became part of the university. He's been in the leadership role of deputy director since 2017, maintaining a very strong commercial focus to engineer ideas and new thinking into application. He was made professor in 2021. Now, I'm not somebody whose work spans engineering, physics, and material science. But I do think of Rod's work as being renaissance in nature, with his team's focus on the birth of new ideas and really intense activity across this span of disciplines. Rod's known for his multidisciplinary knowledge, his capability, and his enterprising spirit. Now, just one example of his work is in electrifying and decarbonizing transport including proposing, managing, and developing the build of an electric motor strong enough to power airplanes. Now, this is the type of cutting-edge work that attracts and includes companies, like Air New Zealand, for instance, and it's also, of course, the type of work that means that Professor Badcock has been a key player both nationally and in international partnerships, particularly, I think, across the Asia-Pacific, as well as Cambridge and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, but Kyoto, Changwon University, among others. All of those types of relationships have yielded PhD agreements, commercial contracts, and new funding opportunities. Everything I know about Rod and have read about him suggests that he's a superb collaborator with overseas colleagues in his research papers and conference presentations. Rod, your work is exceptionally well known and it's highly influential. But more than this, I think about your work as generative and forward-looking. And I think we clearly see this in the power of Rod and his team's translational research. But I think we also see it just as much in Rod's close mentorship of undergraduate and postgraduate students and colleagues at all stages of their careers, just as much as we see it in any individual research agenda. We often talk about people's responsibilities to the next generation, and I believe Rod's a role model here. Many of his students and mentees are now respected experts in their own right, in their own fields, working for the likes of OpenStar, Rocket Lab, high-profile European startups, or they're continuing their journey here at the Robinson Institute. Now tonight, it's Rod's work on what I think is the fascinating phenomenon of superconductivity that's the focus. Superconductors, essentially materials that conduct electricity with zero resistance, most often still when at very low temperatures, can create an extremely powerful magnetic field. Think MRI machines, particle accelerators, and so on. Now, as Rod will describe, unlocking the potential of superconductivity can facilitate a whole range of new applications, including clean, sustainable energy production. Rod noted in the inaugural invitation, though, that it's the people, that it's the multidisciplinary teamwork that helps make the impossible possible. And he'll talk about that as well tonight. I understand what he said in that invitation, but I also think that his phrasing around people speaks with great gusto to Rod's generative and collaborative mm -hmm. style. Nā te honore ki te whakato Ahrangi Rod Badcock. It is my great pleasure 
to introduce Professor Rod Badcock and invite him to the podium. Tena koto katoa, go Rod Badcock, toko inua. Now, thank you, Vice Chancellor, thank you, SN, and all of the people here tonight who, no, the door is locked. That means you can't escape. <laughs> I have you in my grasp here for a little while, and I am going to be talking a lot about the people and, uh, on this journey, and there's going to be a fair number of people here tonight who are going to be shocked to see that I had photos from when they were doing honours work, when they were doing other things. And they're going to have a fun time tonight. So just a bit about Paiho Robinson Research Institute. So we are well known. We're a university research institute. We're proud to be part of Victoria University. Our research students learn through doing. They do it in a world-class R&D environment and they get embedded with commerce, and our alumni are globally sought after. Our values and our goals are very much for a sustainable future. You could say super technologies for a cool planet. We cover more than just one area of superconductivity. We are active across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And it's one of the strengths we bring to bear now, I promise you, I haven't got too much in the way of complex science tonight. I wanted everybody to be able to engage, but I'll just explain what superconductivity means. Now, it enables us, the superconductivity enables us to have very high electrical currents. If you think about your house, is a 60 amp circuit breaker that's sitting on the pole outside. Well, we want to go to thousands of amps. You're thinking about transmitting current into something which doesn't dissipate power. It doesn't generate heat, so it doesn't cause transformers and machines to degrade in the way a conventional wound machine behaves. It is a cryogenic technology. And that means that if you think about the temperatures, as you can see on the graph there, it's important that the superconductivity that we work with operates and when we can use air almost, nitrogen from the air, as one of the refrigerants in a closed cycle. And that means that we can operate sustainably and renewably. Why? It allows us to be compact, lightweight electrical machines that are efficient with increased functionality. It's common. You don't even realise that you're engaging with superconductivity nearly every day around the world in this city, an MR system. You may go for a scan, superconductivity. Materials characterisation in the university, in the commercial research labs, you're engaging with superconductivity in NMR. All the way through to the Large Hadron Collider. And there are millions of kilometres of this type of superconductor around in machines and in the system around the world. There's a few example photos there of typical applications. But where is our journey and where did my journey come from? So actually the origins are with the world, for the world patent inventors of one of the most commercial forms, BISCO. And actually, that comes down to Bob Buckley, who I'm going to embarrass horribly here, and Jeff Tallon, who I'm also going to embarrass horribly at the back there, who were the team that was backed by Bill Robinson at DSIR, who supported them, who, who helped them take what they were discovering and drive a vision. And it's an important vision, and I personally want to thank Professor Bob Buckley because actually what he taught me when I started with this team and his focus on mission-oriented research where you actually drive towards an application is something that is with me and is with all of my students now who have graduated, are graduating 
and are working through that. That's something that you really should be proud of, Bob. So we still follow his mission-oriented approach. It's R&D with a purpose. The team spun out HGS 110. They're world class. Very few people realise there's a company in Lower Hutt who manufacture superconducting magnets and ship them all around the globe. And he brought me in to engineer into practice this smart idea that uh, Nick and himself and a few others from the team had about ruble cable and they wanted to be able to make it and make it at a scale that was commercially viable. I'll just point out that both Bob and Jeff jointly received the inaugural Prime Minister's Science Prize. The very first time it's awarded was awarded to that pair. Thank you. So what was the challenge that I was faced with? The challenge back there that um, was how do we make winding cables? How can we make a cable that we can make a generator from? That we could make a motor? That we can make, reduce the footprint? How can we make it more efficient, higher power, lighter? How do we take what is shown here as a very thin material, so I'm zooming in, it's like for those of us old enough to remember those audio and video cassettes. It's just a one or two micron layer of ceramic. A ceramic material that's brittle, that's just being supported on a metal tape. And that very thin layer, we needed to make something that could carry even more current and we could wind together. How on earth do we do that? So, how on earth do we do that? And how on earth do we grow the capability? So all of a sudden, this is not a, a physics problem purely of a superconductor. It isn't a material science problem of how do you make the material better. This is one that in, uses all of the engineering. How do you shape it? How do you make it? How do you actually make the material behave in the way you want as a cable? And one of the other great things that Bob told all of us was you work and partner. And Nick and Bob brought us in partnership with Siemens as an end user who are pulling the technology towards those applications. And what you're seeing on the, those images is this is the ruble cable wound, supplied from New Zealand, tested by Siemens. This is their generator test coils, where made in New Zealand, supplied to Siemens. So we partnered and drove that development. We transferred that to general cable superconductors. This is the other side of the coin that was instilled with us. Mission-oriented research, transfer into application. Those are strong lessons, and we brought the New Zealand supply chain with us. It started off Siemens with DC Ross, who were probably one of the most superlative fine engineering, fine blanking companies in the world. And we brought them in and they engaged directly with us and it grew their horizons on what the technology was capable of. We gave them the confidence and we had outstanding results. To give you an idea though, as I said, it's not just about the engineering, it's not just the material science. We had to use physics to image the quality of the material coming out of manufacturers overseas of these types of coated conductors. So we had to look at the physics. We had to image currents that were circulating with magnetic field sensors, and we had to build these. You could, this is not an instrument you can buy off the shelf or a process that you could do. We had to develop that real-to-real -real processing. We had to implement it and qualify the material. We had to shape the tape. And there you can see Kent Hamilton. I'm just seeing if I'm going to embarrass Kent now, when he was a much younger man, <laughs> driving one of the, the first, one of the first ruble punching machines. And then we had to wind the cable. Now, I did the impossible back then. The uh, A. Myers Engineering Project Prize used to only go between Canterbury and Auckland. 
Lachlan worked with me from Welltech. He won that prize. And he won it working on the Ruble Cable winding machines with us. He deserves it. Lachlan is now um, the R&T manager at Retail Links. You haven't heard of Retail Links, but you do know the companies who make all of the, um, the, the wood-fired heating systems, the, power, the pellet systems, and he designs and does that. He's gone through a background now of working in robotics, in forestry at DCE, where he was the engineering manager there, and he's the R&D manager now at Retail Links. And he deserves that because he reduced something from complexity to simplicity with us. And it was a team outcome. It used students, local companies, Myriad Engineering, a lot of the Hutt Valley, and it used staff, and it encompasses the whole multidisciplinary nature. And if you want to see how this works, hang on. Aha. I've got a few videos embedded for everybody here so you can see how this works. What you are looking at, there will be some zoom in on this shortly. You're looking, notice that the spools are despooling and maintaining tension. And they're maintaining orientation. And they're traversing around each other. It starts to become complex. This isn't like string being twisted into rope. You have to keep this flat. So you see how it phase off? See, they're coming off straight, they're rotating around. So this is, uh, to any mechatronics student, they'll realise this is quite interesting automation. This is automation you wouldn't normally see. This is what it looks like, looking up along the spools. You can see the strands passing. You can, and we're going to take that material and we're going to wind it in like this. So it's forming a cable. And this was achieved by working as a team to make the cable like this. So what next? Okay, so we supplied Siemens. We engineered the material, we solved the challenges in how do you qualify it and assess it. But it doesn't stop there. That's another thing Bob ta ta taught us is, well, how do you get it out there? The team ethos has been apply it out in the world. Get it out there, make it work. So how do we join cables? Well, so all of a sudden you've got all of these conductors, how do you join them together? How do we manage AC loss? So any conductor want to see an AC loss. How do we wind the motor? How do we put it in there? How do we restrain the windings? How do we power the windings? We're starting to get more and more questions. And actually, Nathan Allpress, on the top right there, he's a key engineer with Callaghan. He started with us as a project student. He was an honours project from Canterbury. He was with us working on this, contributed, massive contribution to what we were doing around the soldering processes, then worked as an intern with us, actually helped solve the challenges for the next thing I'm going to talk about. But where do we get those people skilled to do this? Now, Rati's going to be feeling embarrassed because I managed to find a photo of him not long after his, uh, he was on his honours project. Ratu Matara is in the audience here. So I'm, everybody will now look at you, Ratu. And he looks very youthful there. He's just finishing a, his PhD in physics, uh, his PhD, his degree in physics at Victoria. And he got energised with working with us in the Institute. He contributed to a number of things. We sent him to our collaborators over in the US who manufactured superconductors. They didn't want to send him back. <laughs> so we knew we had to grow the skills base. You can't pick these people off a tree. You have to grow them, you have to grow that capability. Ratu's been through quite a journey with us, but he's not the only one. So has Lockie, so has Kent, so has Mike Davies, many of the people in the team. And I'm, I'm looking to see if Gus is here, because I'm going to embarrass you next. <laughs> but we have to grow them, but we have to collaborate with the best. 
And you'll look along that line of companies there, and you'll say, hmm, collaborating with Llama Engineering. Who are Llama? Llama win, uh, build the performance engines that have won nearly every class of motorsport in New Zealand over the last few years. They have made the, the engines and the systems that are winning in Australia. But Mark is a humble engineer who did his apprenticeship with Air New Zealand. He worked with us when he was previously with Callaghan before he, sent his, he went on his own to form his engineering company that does this. He's humble, but he's incredibly gifted. And we'll show you some of the things that he's produced, as well as General Cable Superconductors, DC Ross. He stands alongside some of our suppliers who have grown with us. Fabrum Solutions. When we started working with them, there were three people, and they made canoes, and they made um, parts for motorcycles. Now, they supply cryogenic composites and cryo corners all around the world. They're part of the NASA Lunar Mission. And it's because you stand with them and hold their hand when they, when they approach a challenging problem that gives them the confidence. And that's how we've grown. Again, thank you, Bob. <laughs> Under Bob's tutelage is how we've grown some of these companies. They've grown their capability and they've gone off on their own journeys and their own stand themselves. Sorry. But I think it's important to think about some of the students that have been through us, that I've interacted with directly while they've been studying. I haven't got everybody. I have got some nice young photos of people like uh, Gus, who actually is that young fellow here, and anybody who knows him now who's finished, he's finished and awarded here, well, so he's going to be awarded on the Wednesday evening ceremony at Michael Fowler as part of the Marae Takanga service. He's now an expert in his own right. We sent him to Cambridge with our collaborators at the start of his PhD. We sent him alongside, so Ratu and Gus both went to Cambridge University, studied under our close collaborators, learned everything they could teach them about electromagnetic field modelling, and they came back with Mark Ainsley telling us they're showing me how to do stuff now. So again, a credit to New Zealand. Kent Hamilton joined us as a fresh graduate. He's then done a master's. He's actually just submitted his PhD. He's been, he's been doing his PhD part-time on the motors and systems. We look around this, these people here. They're all in positions. These are all people who prior to their involvement with Robinson, didn't know about how you could apply superconductivity, and they become our envoys out in the rest of the world. Many of them have very high profile positions in organisations all over the world. So where do you apply it? We said we made the cable, so let's, challenge, let's attack a problem. And one of the biggest team problems was a grid transformer. It's an industry problem that we challenged ourselves with because it meant more than just the superconductor. The superconductor engineering is that much of the problem. The cryogenic system, the composites, the way you interconnect, the way you cool it, for it to operate, to, to meet the electrical specification, to survive the insulation. To do that is a huge challenge. To do that, we had to bring the companies along with us. But the advantage is smaller, lighter, more efficient. And we did it with a world record in the current in the transformer. And we showed that actually the utility of the robo cable could be applied to these sorts of machines. And that is the, this is one of the phases being wound, and that is the transformer. Where to from there? Well, obviously. We want to see it being used, part of the mission, part of what we're about. So we worked with the Chinese railroad construction company who do the high-speed bullet trains in China. 
And it was a national project. And we showed that you could design that form of, tra that form of transformer in a way that you could double the um, effective payload on those trains or increase the speed. Major thing, reduce the volume, reduce the mass, raise the efficiency. And we showed that the AC loss in the wind is key to that success. And we did it with IP that's held in New Zealand and is still held here. So is it the solution to high-speed rail? We think so. And actually, I think Jeff and Todd is going to say a few bits about it alongside myself. So I promise not to bore you with just my voice. The Robinson Research Institute has formed a multi-party Chinese collaboration, revolutionising high-speed train travel across Asia and Europe. So the core of our work has been in applying superconductivity to build machines that are more efficient, about a third of the size and about a third of the mass. We've secured a very large contract it's worth three other companies in China and this is about enabling trains to go faster and they want to go across Asia at 450k. Our technology enables that. The Chinese government has a strategic project to connect China with other countries and the rail is a key part of that strategy. They very much see us as being a supplier into their chain and being incorporated in. They want to accelerate their manufacture. The natural way we work in New Zealand, which is alongside those companies for that innovation, is very much what they want to do. That's when you know this is really no longer just a transaction, it's a partnership. Beyond the core Traction Transformers project for China, there are opportunities to leverage the technology globally. Basically, this whole relationship's growing, so Victoria will end up having a strategic relationship with them that is teaching, its research, and its commercialisation. That is the best thing that you can possibly imagine. We're excited by actually seeing it being used and being used widely. The opportunity is there with China. They just want to bring the best expertise together to deliver the outcomes. They have real challenges that they need to solve, ideal partnerships for us. Well, I think we're just at the beginning of an exciting journey. As part of that, that's driven joint PhD arrangements with China. We have a close relationship with some of that joint PhD supervision and joint PhD students who join us here in New Zealand. But it's about solving application specific problems. How do you overcome the real problem, not just the problem in the lab? And we showed that you can bring the New Zealand supply chain into cutting edge international markets. But are we ready? for the next big problems. Some of the people in this room know exactly about our electricity system. We're blessed by our resources and our renewable supply. We have truly sustainable and renewable electricity supply in this country. But transport is our dirty little secret in that it is a massive drain on our economy, the import of oil, and what we burn and emit into the, into the air. Our transport routes are long and skinny, and often the only rapid transit option available to us without massive infrastructure investment is aviation. Internationally, it's coming under closer scrutiny. Our flag carrier also wants to decarbonise what they're doing but we need to do it in a way that is sustainable without crippling our high value exports. And the technology that you could use for aviation can be applied on other heavy transport. So electric heavy transport could make an enormous impact on our fuel imports and our greenhouse gas emissions. So how do we solve that? With a lot of help. So it's not just the staff. I, I particularly chose here students working on this problem. I will highlight Jefferson Gonzalez, who's joined us for optical fibre sensing in cryogenic environments. He joined us to study a PhD with me. Hugely successful. We're looking at Tony and Gus. Gus did his PhD, looking at AC loss and stacks. 
of superconductor. Tony is imaging the supercurrent in a power supply that fits in the palm of your hand that fails thousands of amps. You aiming AC loss towards the transformers and being able to model it. Ratu, I found you again. <laughs> Kent Hamilton, really exceptional the way that Kent has developed, very proud of the way he's developed from being, starting with me as just a graduate through now as a really high class independent researcher, just like all of the others. And Mohammed, Mohammed joined me to solve the problems around how do we reduce friction out of the bearings in these machines so we can make them efficient? How do we make them go really fast? He holds the record now. So he's had, he's had the machines running in our lab at 108,000, and he's under pressure at the moment because I want 200,000 RPM. And we think we can do it. So actually, I have a little video that is amusing, at least to my wife, because uh, the ministry made this video about the aviation, and uh, because of my accent, I was subtitled. <laughs> Here today at the Robinson Research Institute, part of the uh, Faculty of Engineering at, Robert, at Victoria University of Wellington. This lab is where all of the real science and engineering work associated with the superconducting machines happens. Here, we're carrying out work to develop the world's fastest superconducting electric motor that's going to be powering the next generation of electric aircraft to carry passengers on domestic travel. Domestic aircraft currently are one of the worst polluters into the environment. They emit their, their, their emissions right at the worst point in the atmosphere and it's been recognised by the Paris Accord and we've got to reduce the emissions from aircraft by 30% um, by 2030. Part of that means we have to go to turbo electric aircraft. But in order to do turbo electric aircraft it requires superconducting motors. This is part of an international effort at solving the challenges around delivering those high speed motors. We follow a strategy to, uh, of developing systems that can be manufactured in New Zealand from this type of technology. MB have been funding um, projects and some of the genesis of this work came out of smart ideas and that's all come together at the much higher level now towards the application where we're integrating in with the world experts and the world leading companies to deliver the uh, world's fastest machine. So what now? I can show you where the generator for a hybrid system is, but actually we've taken it bigger. We've taken the Robinson principle and we've applied it to a much wider degree across the whole country. And we did that through a technology platform program with the Ministry. And this is integrating in for the electrif electrifying large-scale transport. Can we accelerate the development of small, light, high-power propulsion systems for aviation and for land transport? Look at the whole of system. Nobody who wants to make something work will just look at a motor. They look at the cooling system. They look at the way you integrate it. How do you have the drivetrain? How do you have the power feed to it? So we needed to cover those areas off. Where are the people going to come from? Key part of our strategic agreement with Air New Zealand is around how do we plan? How are we going to service? What are we going to do? So we need a whole new range of technology practitioners not just undergraduates, not just postgraduates. We actually need also techni technicians, technical practitioners. What are the te primary technology gaps? What system design trade-offs? Any engineer worth his salt or her salt looks at a system and says, it's never going to be perfect, but what do I trade off? How do I optimise the outcome? So we use the principles that, again, thank you, Bob, <laughs> we work with the best. We train the next generation and we use the application to drive the R&D. And we have an impressive 
set of partners. We have Air New Zealand, we have Airbus, we have Pratt & Whitney, Callaghan Innovation around some of this very specific cryocooler technology. We've used the cryogenic system technology out of AUT. We're using ARA and Manukau because we actually are driving a whole new level four program that is actually doing those, uh, that training of the practitioners that Air New Zealand want to roll out with their staff. We're working with University of Cambridge. We now work with multiple teams. We're working with the gallium nitride research team. We're working with the applied superconductivity team. We're working with the electronic devices team. We're across three teams wanting to work on this with us. Kyoto University, University of Canterbury, Power Electronics with University of Auckland. We have the best team in the country around the Power Electronics and they're now upskilled in doing cooled cryogenic Power Electronics that make the aircraft happen. And we're driving that in a way that is opening the full system opportunities. And then we've cased in Korea, one of the best experts on cryogenic system design in the coolers is working with us very closely. So it's a strong team and we've got a lot of people coming through. There are people in this room who, I'm, I'm gonna look up and embarrass you, Sophie, who have worked on things that are not just superconducting. Sophie is an electronic, uh, sorry, is a computer systems, computer scientist in ECS. She came in and has helped us do the modeling and the systems around the whole electric drivetrain, cryogenic, hydrogen, battery, hybrid, and the models are being rolled out across the world through a platform that's open source that all of the developers are using for an aero visualization monitoring. Sophie, of course, is very embarrassed that I'm pointing you out because uh, you're still an undergraduate and you're with me again this summer. <laughs> But it's not just that, it's everybody in this room. Bradley. Bradley, you've matured. We had a number of ex-computer ex systems people. Stand up, Bradley, say hello. <laughs> who, who, who joined us from, from ECS? He did ESEN as the course, um, and he joined us to do his study as masters. I've never had a masters who didn't get a distinction, and he didn't let me down. <laughs> Research masters. Bradley, of course, worked with us. He interned. He worked with us as an RA for a while after as well. But he's flown off. He's part of a growing empire that's coming out of the monster that's been created by one of my ex-PhD students. Uh, but that's a great monster to have. It's creating a drive and a pull on those students. So what have they been working on? How about the generator, high speed? It's a simple architecture. Most of it was manufactured in New Zealand. Unfortunately, I had to get my Litz wire windings for the stator wound in the USA. And I say that because I really did want to do it here. And I think the next one we will be able to do here. It's groundbreaking in that it's one of the fastest machines that generates power on a superconducting machine. We, de we developed it as a platform to demonstrate a high technology readiness level. It's critical. If I want you to be flying on an aircraft, notice I said I want you to be flying on an aircraft with one of my motors on, <laughs> then actually we need to erase the TRL. So we, we used elements that were already high TRL. We simplified. You're looking at the windings after they came back from Ever Everson Tesla on the stator here. You're looking at the rotor, made in lower hut, precision balanced, like a megawatt racing car engine can be balanced. It uses a demonstrator, it becomes a demonstrator platform for coils made by HTS 110, integrating our fiber optic sensing onto those, demonstrating the flux pumps. How do you produce a thousand amps, something in your hand? And so we can test and validate the different schemes at high speed.
But the other thing we've done is we've kept IP. For aviation, some of the key IP is in the flux pumps. It enables you to reduce the cooling system mass by 90%. If you want to see how much of an effect that is, I gave you the example earlier of the high-speed rail and the transformer. Half of the mass on, a on, on that high-speed rail transformer, on a conventional transformer, is a cooling system to be able to handle the losses through that system. It's the same story when you consider other technologies like this. This technology allows us to drop the cryogenic load. And in an aircraft, mass is critically important. Mass of the cryocooler, the mass of the current sources, the mass of the fuel. So this is how you achieve what everybody wants to do. So even with the global effort that's happening around superconducting machines being required for the large-scale aviation, they all want to access the New Zealand IP and want to work with us on that. And that brings our supply chain into those systems. So what is the aviation solution? So this is what Grant Lumsden is pulling his hair out over at the moment. Just looking around, I saw he's up there. <laughs> and he's pulling his hair out because we're finalising the design for the build of this machine. We're working with partners internationally and we've brought a whole system. I mean, it's gone through a number of iterations already, but we're integrating the cooling system. It has additive manufacturing that enables us to drop mass out of the cooling system. It has the cry corner integrated in, and we're using multifunctionality to deliver the whole system objective. So it doesn't just stop with the mechanics. Lightweight power electronics. We're finding things out on the behaviour now that are enabling us to make very efficient, very small power converters. And that's possible by, again, work with the best. That team that we're working with on those power transfer are some of the best in the world. We're upskilling them in the cryogenics. They're upskilling us in how we solve this problem. It's a win-win for the whole country. And we're producing the industry-ready training strategies. So what's next? Okay, so we have a vision. That vision isn't just aviation, it isn't just motors. We're making a difference in sustainable aviation, but the challenges we're solving enable heavy transport. The knowledge, the technology and IP is being used to leverage and bootstrap other applications. It's great when I have staff and students saying that they're going to leave because they're setting something up and they're going to take some of, some of your staff with them. A cryogenic optical sensing is at the heart of fusion energy in Commonwealth fusion systems in the USA. It's a critical failure protection in what they're doing for the world for the step reactor, for the step fusion, for clean, sustainable energy, and it's the heart of their protection. We're building a superconducting flux pump. James Rice is one of the PhD students who's actually flying out to Oxford, to Cullum, to the Jet Laboratory as part of the Magnet team um, in just two weeks' time. And he's looking at a 50,000 amp supply that supplies the tokamak field coils from something that fits in a 5U rack. So, there is more, I could say, but I'm not going to. But there's commercial opportunities that are happening here in New Zealand. They're already being leveraged. They're already growing. We have exciting technology, partners, and a nascent New Zealand industry that could enable a low-carbon future, not just for us, but for the rest of the world. There is a high value science and engineering opportunity that we are bringing the next generation into. I get excited when they get excited that they see that they can do mechatronics, they can do that engineering, they can actually make a difference to the carbon future for themselves. 
those opportunities are growing. Our alumni are already creating new industries in sustainable energy generation here in New Zealand. They're bringing new challenges and they're growing this high value market for domestic exploitation. And I think it's cool. They're absorbing our postgraduates into a new emerging industry. So where does that put the Institute? That puts the Institute with a huge reach internationally. I realize I haven't updated some of the newer um, partners that we have on here, but we're active over the whole world. And it's part of where our mission is. But I'm grateful to the staff at students at Piho Robinson, in particular Prof Bob Buckley, and all of these young people. I didn't have all of the staff or the, some of the junior staff. These are some of the people who have come through as students, through me, have interacted with me. You'll see your names up there. I'm working on. There may be a few that are missing because when I counted them up, I realised there were more than 60. But that's the story and they're the people who are going to drive this forward and actually make a name and their stand for this university. So with that, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto. Before I go to my sheet, I have to say, I think we agree that that was a super presentation by a super professor and a super story about super students, super graduates, and uh, super entrepreneurs, super scientists, super engineers working for a super institute with a super leadership, helping us to be a super university in a super country. So well done, thank you. <laughs> it's not all about superconductivity. This is one of those lectures that uh, I understood most of it, and I'm just, I feel comfortable. Uh, my name is Ehsan Mesbahi. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculties of Science, Health, Engineering, Architecture, and Design Innovation, and I also look after uh, our fantastic three research institutes, uh, Robinson Research Institute, Ferry Research Institute, and Antarctic Research Institute, uh, Center. And it's my great pleasure to give the vote of thanks to Professor Rod Batcock for tonight's lecture. And from here onwards, I'm not going to call you Professor Rod Batcock. I'm going to call, call you Rod. Is that the right? Yeah. Uh, Paiho, Robinson Research Institute, are world-leading pioneers of high temperature superconductivity. Uh, tonight, Rod provided a glimpse into how this multidisciplinary team have been engineering the science of superconductivity into application, from generators to power transformers to high field magnets to trains to transportation systems and beyond. As a long serving member and the deputy director uh, Rod is at the forefront of this innovation, a key player in Robinson's journey to making the impossible possible. In this lecture, he highlighted the key priorities which have contributed to his team's success in solving complex scientific and engineering problems, including partnership, developing emerging talent, and removing technical roadblocks. We are all too aware of the importance of this work at the time of climate crisis, where reducing energy waste and carbon emissions is of critical importance. I have to mention that our university is committed to sustainability, and soon, hopefully, our academic will be able to travel on electric, electrically driven airplanes, and so we get rid of the, our carbon footprint once and for all. So this also helps us to reduce energy waste and, and carbon emissions in all the other things that we do, cars and any other modes of transport. 
Some of Rod's notable projects include the development of the manufacturing and qualification of robot cables for GCS, the design and build of a one megavolt amp superconducting power transformer, development of the HDS dynamos for machines, and the NZMB program developing aircraft HDS electric propulsion technology. But his contributions extend beyond his cutting edge research on his teaching and supervision of a large number of postgraduate research students, some of whom are now our staff and participating, speaking, and contributing to major international conferences and leading international partnership initiatives. Rod has demonstrated that it is it, it truly takes a village to achieve the impossible. Tonight he spoke about uh, Professor Bob Buckley's tenacity, drive, and focus for mission-oriented or mission-led research. It's very obvious that all those are shared qualities by Rod and what we are incredibly privileged to have him in our university and our team and our division. Someone at the frontier of research that will be life-changing and sustaining for all of us in the years to come. Rod is not only an expression of what we are good at, he is also a great example of what we are good for and also with a clear direction of what we should be good for in future years. Rod, it's my pleasure, it's my honor to be your colleague and to congratulate you on a fantastic inaugural professorial lecture. And with this, I would like to invite everyone here to join us uh, outside the room for some refreshments. But before going there, I would like to join me again to thank Rod for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you.